in my uh, office, I have a, a very large map of China hmm. hanging, which is um, a map which was done by a Chinese, uh, well, a, a sociologist of China on the topic of quality of life. So it's a quality of life uh -huh. map yeah. of um, the, the whole of China. And it's at the um, it's at a pretty fine level. It's uh, maybe the county level. And so what it shows as you look at the map is uh, regions with um, or really micro areas with high quality of life, medium quality of life and very low quality of life. It's a very dramatic um, map because it kind of reflects the backwardness and underdevelopment of the interior of the country and the rapid yeah. economic progress of the coastal parts of the country. But uh, are you aware of any kind of mapping like that of India? Yes. Quality of life and poverty? Actually, in India, India, I mean, uh, one thing that we don't want for is research and uh, is that, you know, overall sort of macro research. We do now have um, um, human development reports for every state of India. So, uh, you know, you, you the, the UNDP is... Uh, um, indices of development in terms of literacy, schooling, incomes, and uh, different aspects of uh, demographic achievement. We have, mm -hmm. I mean, this is now available for in, in India um, for, for all the states, actually, almost all the states of India. Uh, so we, we do have that kind of, and that too shows. Uh, enormous variation as 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 you can imagine it shows enormous variation and uh, it also shows a great deal of divergence between it shows that um, and this is something we've discussed in the past that you don't know that it's not always the areas of high income that have high human development achievements the the big example being kerala where even before uh, Kerala re reached, uh, you know, I mean, Kerala was able to, through wise spending and through mass uh, mass mobilization, was able to advance far ahead of India. In fact, ahead of China as many of human development indicators, long before it achieved comparable levels of income increase. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back to, um, we, we talked uh, a little bit earlier about the um, village studies and the way in which you are harnessing your expertise as an economist to studies which will be directly helpful, directly um, um, constructive in terms of moving towards a, a more just agrarian system. I'm talking about the village studies and the study of agrarian change. Um, what I'd like to talk about just a little bit right now is your thinking about that interface between expert PhD economic research and the involvement of activists and peasant organizations and, and women's organizations and so forth. Uh, see, I think that, uh, um, well, I'm involved in a, in a, now in a program of village studies, which uh, we are, uh, well, my, my friends and my colleagues and I are, conducting in different parts of the country. Let's go, let me back up a bit on this. Now, I, I think that, you know, one of the most uh, important sets of issues in our contemporary world, as I've said, is the agrarian question in less developed countries. And uh, the impact that the uh, accelerated, accelerated introduction of policies of stabilization and structural adjustment have had on the conditions of life and work of the working people in the countryside. Um, in India, as I said, this uh, the whole agrarian question is crucial to, to social development in general and social change in general. Uh, historically, the left in the third world and in India, um, particularly in India, has urged scholarship to turn its face to the countryside, to conduct specific change uh, studies of class changes there and to evaluate these changes. Now, the uh, this task in general, of course, is not only a scholarly one, but one that involves, uh, you know, activists, organizers. But it is nevertheless one to which scholars can and must uh, 
make a contribution. So, in my perception, uh, we've written on this, Madhura and I, agrarian studies are driven by a political imperative. Since, uh, since movements for socio-political change need continually to be reinforced by, not only by mass political activity, but also by analysis. Um, and I think for some years, scholarship has tended to lag behind the very rapid and complex changes that have occurred in the countryside in less developed countries. But, um, and yet, you know, agrarian studies must not so lag because uh, we must grasp the meaning of what's happening in the villages uh, over and over again. Um, this is the imperative. So when we go out to study uh, the, the countryside, we, many of our questions are shaped by, by the political questions, the, the mass demands that are raised by, uh, by organizations such as the, the main peasant organizations and agricultural labor organizations and women's organizations. Uh, many, of the, many, of the, many of the questions that are raised by them are the questions that are directly of interest to us. At the same time, uh, there's a division of labor in society. We, we have been trained in uh, methods of uh, an economic and socioeconomic analysis, statistics, and so on. Which we, and these are, this is a training that we try to bring to bear on our studies of, of, of this. I think that's a very interesting way of putting it, that the, um, there's kind of a cooperation between the organization and the scholar, where the organization is helping to set the research agenda which problems are important, which problems are not so important. And then the economist, the sociologist can help then investigate those particular problems. Uh, that's one way of putting it, yes, yeah. What, 